Welcome, welcome to Geek View Tavern, where smart folks engage in loose talk about the geeky movies, TV shows, and comics that you love. Remember to like the video, share it with friends, and please subscribe. In this episode, Squadron Supreme or Squadron Sinister, the Furry Blue Beast, Patsy Walker's Hellcat, and Marvel's Avengers vs. Defenders. Okay, Skeeter, hit the intro. Writing the Defenders during the Avengers Defenders War was that that was uh, Engelhart, Engelhart. Right? That was Engelhart. Yeah. yeah, it was Engelhart. Yeah, yeah. Engelhart usually was the. Go-to I love that. I love that. That was that, one of my that favorite. That summer comics. event just yeah. grabbed me by the balls. It was and, just. Yeah. And that event, as we call it, was just Engelhart. I'm writing two books at once, so I'm going to coordinate them. Right. It wasn't yeah. an editorial event any more than Thomas finishing off his Doctor Strange story over other books that he was writing was an event. It right. just was, it was serendipity because they were writing both books and they could make it happen. Yeah, but look at that cover. How great is that? Oh, yeah. I remember that. And I can't even tell who is that. Anybody can art spot that? It's clearly um, Buckler? Either, either fixes or inks by Ramita, but I don't know. I don't know who drew it. It might well, be, it might be Sal. It might, I don't know. All right. So that cover is Ramita pencils and Esposito inks. Really? Yep. Well, that explains why it's so Ramita e. But the insides are Bob Brown. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Bob Brown did a lot of Avengers back in that that neck of the woods. Well, he was he was fast period. and he was workmanlike and he didn't mind drawing team books. Yeah. Well, here's here's a little factoid that I just dug off the Wikipedia page here. Uh, editor Stan Lee wanted to write all the Silver Surfer stories personally. It asked other writers not to use the character. Suggested that Thomas use Doctor Strange instead. All right. So the Defenders cover that we looked at number one, that is Sal Buscema pencils and Jim Mooney on the inks. Okay. Mooney was always pretty good on Sal, I thought. Not as good as Klaus, but pretty pretty good. Well, Klaus yeah. could make me look like somebody special, right? I mean, that guy. Right. Yeah. Which is funny because I never warmed to Klaus's pencils at all. Yeah. No, he's terrible pencil. He was very stiff. Yeah, I didn't like his, I was not a big fan of his pencils, but boy, let him ink just about anybody and he looked, it, he Thick stuff and made it look great. Like Leia Lois pencils were always stiff too, but he was I, a great inker. I don't know. I kind of I, I got a warm spot for for Leia Lois pencils. I have to say. Hey, look oh, at that! Since we're going down the rabbit hole, look at that question. Defenders number eight. Well, that's everybody. That's good. Mind slaves of the Red Ghost. Yep. Oh, yeah, okay. I forgot oh, Hawkeye God, was involved with the team briefly, and he's always trying to put the moves on Valkyrie too. Basically, right. everyone's trying to throw a leg over Valkyrie, and who can blame them, right? Yeah, but except Doctor Strange, because he has no use for women. Well, that's right, because Doctor Strange has Clea and Wong waiting for him back at the. <laughs> that's right. Corner. He's got. I he's got a, more Wong. Yeah, he's got a, Wong. Yeah. Yeah, he's that's got a Wong. I don't want to be right. Though, that brazier that she wore, though, there was something criminal about that. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's... not criminal. What, did, what? What kind of law do you practice, sir? <laughs> Her gag was women's liberation, right? She called every right. all the men. Yeah. Well, originally, but by the time Gerber got a hold of her, she didn't give a crap about that anymore. Yeah, well, he didn't give a crap about doing superhero stories at all. He just had these characters. He'd attack slumlords or racists or whatever right. he was interested in. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, no, give him the Sons of the Serpent. He'll be, he'll be, he'll, he'll keep those guys alive for eight issues just to yeah. screw around with it. Yeah, get me. I yeah. love all. Now of them. I have another question for you guys, for all of you guys, comic book experts. The Squadron Sinister versus the Squadron Supreme. Yeah. Different versions of Nighthawk. I'm confused. Yeah, I'm what too. the hell happened there? I mean, I know, I know they were all JLA characters, right? Essentially, yeah. redos of those characters. So Hyperion was Superman, and and yeah. uh, Nighthawk was supposed to be Batman, and all that. It seemed like they're not very good versions yeah. of those characters. Yeah, and Dr. my Spectre understanding was, uh, is Green that Lantern, they were right? that they were that there's duplicates of all that stuff, and they're from different dimensions. Yep. So because. The, so the squadron, squadron Sinister is in the regular Marvel Earth, no, right? No, no, they came squadron over. Squadron Sinister is. The Squadron Sinister no, 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 isn't. The, they came I, over I thought from the another... Squadron Supreme wasn't. 
Wait, the squadron, so the squadron supreme, the squadron sinister uh, was from another dimension. Yes, that and then they came to over me. to they came over to the Avengers dimension in order to have right. their fight. And then somebody went, "Oh, I'll bet I there's a version that. of that world where they're actually the good guys." Oh, oh, we'll do that story. That was Grunwald. I did not know that. I, so they're they're always from a they're always from a uh, a different extra dimensional. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but Grunwald is just a... Because once they were dispatched, the Squadron Supreme would go back to their dimension, and then occasionally they would filter over somehow or other. Mm -hmm. um, like Dr. Spectrum at some point came over and uh, attacked the of Iron Man. Yeah. But Grunwald was always like the bad photocopy of Engelhart. And they did this Squadron Supreme miniseries in the 80s, which was kind of a, you know, a proto-Watchmen book. Yeah, where... right. The idea was, okay, we'll do a 12-issue miniseries about what if superheroes became fascists and tried to solve all the world's problems. I remember enjoying it in the day, but I reread it more recently, and I didn't think it held up very well. All right, so so just looking it up on Wikipedia, I didn't realize they were this old. It said the Squadron Sinister appeared in Avengers 69. Yeah. And the first version was formed by the elders of the universe as the uh, the Grandmaster, basically they were, uh, as pawns to battle the champions of King the Conqueror. Of course, why not? That's where they were formed. So they weren't from a dimension to begin with. And then Gruenwald took them in 71. It doesn't say that they were from another dimension. So I don't know if they came in it there. I don't know. It's weird. Well, it's, I, like it's all over the board. Well, yeah, they, did, I, they, they did this in the Defenders pretty early on. There's Strange yeah. versus Dr. Spectrum and, and Namor in his better blue suit versus the Wizard. Mm -hmm. yep. Hyperion. Hyperion's in the red in the front. Yep. And I just read this a couple weeks ago and I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a Gil Kane cover, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it looks like. I mean, with but with fixes, right? I mean, clearly that's a Gil arm well, and a not, Gil leg. Well, that's a Gil Hulk, but that's yeah. not Gil's face. It's a Ramita face. And that's a uh, pimp suit and Namor, too. He's out of his Speedos now. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when they decided to put him in the blue, the blue suit, which I I actually liked better. I, I never too. liked him. I like I never understood why he had to be so naked all the time. <laughs> well, because you know men of a certain age like. <laughs> yeah, I, the first I ran into the Squadron Sinister slash Supreme was in a later issue of the Avengers that led to the origin of the Hellcat. Oh so, sure, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because right? they're like poking around in the basement of Roxxon Oil or something, and Roxxon is going to other dimensions to pump oil or some. <laughs> thing and it's and they find a, a crate that has the original costume from the cat right from greer nelson's yeah original before, costume right before patsy walker puts right? it on and become okay. the next and thing the you beast know is part of the Avengers at that point and the and the beast story had patsy walker was, had discovered the beast's secret identity and was blackmailing him demanding to be turned into a superhero she'd reveal his identity and so when he's on this she's tagging along on this adventure with the avengers and when they find the the cat costume hank throws it at her and says put it on okay now we're square and that's how she becomes hellcat this that's is right. just for my friend chris there's your pal that's there's that. your pal kyle richmond bouncing off the blob yeah. that's right oh, yeah, i had that one yeah. i had that that was the first issue just when, I was, just when I was collecting comics yeah that was 1974 summer 74 is the first one i ever bought but look at this thing oh my god you got magneto in the back with dr strange you've got him bouncing off the blob and you've got well that's not white wingfoot who's the hulk punching out Unis. Unis, the yeah. untouchable. The untouchable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the blob was one of my favorite guys i always want to see the blob fight the kingpin <laughs> the two fat guys right that, that are be, like unmovable so if, you can it, keep, if they can keep their feet on the ground it'd be like those videos of, of people with exercise <laughs> balls crashing into each other and bouncing <laughs> off backwards a sumo match that's right <laughs> who could smell well, i guess there's gym? hyperion always seemed like a lame character i always hated his costume Hyperion's origin is kind of cool. The idea is that you know it's like Krypton, except it's microscopic. His whole his whole universe was was the microverse, and it was unwittingly destroyed by some kind of uh, mad scientist. And then he he's right. the lone survivor of his destroyed microscopic universe and runs amok. I say, I thought all their costumes were terrible, with the exception of Dave Cockrum. I can't think of anybody at Marvel that was actually a good costume character designer. Like, what was the best co uh, character that came out of the seventies in terms of like? A cool Wolverine. costume and all that. Wolverine, the X Men characters. Yeah, the X Men reboot, except for the yeah. except for the Native American guy, Thunderbird. And oh, there's listen. and there uh, there he is. There there's, yeah. there's right. the executioner. Okay. So that's kind of 
Gerber's first issue of the of the Defenders because he wraps up this story in Defenders number twenty. Okay. Yeah, well, I think he'd been doing two and one for a while at that point. Yeah. And in two and one, he was always grabbing these sad sack characters or these forgotten characters. Like in issue number four of two and one, he does the Guardians of the Galaxy, which right. hadn't been seen since nineteen sixty eight or something. Yeah, although that one shot. Some, some of yeah. that, some of that is is trademark. Yeah, grabbing right. I mean, that's yeah. sort of the point of two and one. Well, and Marvel, also, and Marvel, but also, uh, also for Gerber by bringing back an old character that no one gives a shit about, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted and nobody would complain. Right? Yeah, yeah people would leave him alone. Yeah. So when so he could go off into these weird Gerber flights of fancy where he could just battle a talking tree or a, <laughs> a rainy fire hydrant and <laughs> what he gave us. Doctor Bong or. Right, Dr. Bong. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pretty good, cool character. If I'm ever haunted by a ghost, it's going to be Gerber. I always liked it when the defenders were always made up of like the, like the most, some of the most powerful characters in the Marvel universe, and they were always getting beaten up and needing help from God only knows who. What? I liked it because they were so strong that if they could ever stop bitching at each other. They could they could basically beat everybody, but they're so busy, their interpersonal Hill Street Blues saying elsewhere bitchiness <laughs> keeps them from ever being a, a cohesive unit. So, yeah. so so get this on the cover of Defenders twenty four, Doctor Strange, the Valkyrie, Yellow Jacket, Nighthawk, Son of Satan, Daredevil, Hulk, and Power Man. There we go. We're in the Gerber era now, man. Hey, man, that's like total <laughs> and, testosterone. And guess, and guess who they're fighting? Come on, guess. Uh, Mephisto. The Sons of the Serpent, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> so how, how, did the, how did the first incarnation of the Defenders end? What was like the last well, thing that I, happened? I can Gerber, actually answer Gerber? this question. So, yep. so Gerber wrote it for you know three years or something, and then Keith Giffen and David Anthony Kraft came in and wrote it for a while, and I actually think those issues are really good. Duel was wrinkling his nose at it, but I think – who remembers Scorpio and some of the other ones they did were really good. And then um, it kind of meandered like Peter Gillis wrote a few million years or something. And it, it ran out of steam around issue 125 ish. And oh, then they wow. came up with this contrived reason for to break up the defenders, which was some prophecy that if the Hulk, the Submariner and Dr. Strange, if they ever combined again, it would lead to the doom of all reality. It would destroy the world. Some sort of terrible prophecy would be fulfilled. So the three of them could never be in the same room together again. And they disbanded the Avengers. And then the book was rebooted as The New Defenders. Right. Which ran for another 40, 50 odd issues. Um, and then it was became the new the, defenders uh, during the big pre-image, post-image boom, wasn't it? Yeah. And then it was actually canceled uh, to make inventory space for a new universe. It was one right. of the it was casualty of the new universe. And that was the end of oh, Defenders. Yeah. And the end of and the new defenders books, you know, had like like Gar- gargoyle in it was a character like no one even yeah, remembers. Gargoyle Marvel. was a regular team member for yeah like like two and a half years or something stupid like that what the hell is this you know one even remembers marvel had a character called gargoyle so they're forgettable books in every sense of the word oh cool. i didn't realize that the beast reformed the team yeah i think he was like the leader of the secret defenders or something yeah of the of the of the, of the new defenders the yeah. beast has been everywhere. Like they tried to have him in Avengers too, right? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, he was a he was an Avenger for a long time. I only, yeah. but I only like the beast when he's funny. Yeah, funny and blue. That'll always be my beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they found that you go back and look at the first couple issues of X Men, the Kirby Lee X Men, and the beast doesn't have much of a personality. They on issue four or five, they land on the idea of him being a, a genius and right. using. Five dollar words for everything of being erudite, and because I think they realized he was just a less interesting looking Ben Grimm. Yeah, right. So they gave him this this intellectual twist, and then they turn him into to furry blue, furry blue beast. There's some great issues of Amazing Adventures where yeah. he's uh, where he becomes the he becomes the beast that I know and love. Yeah, uh, I remember those. Oh, yeah, I, they, I love those. I love those when stories. They gave him his solo book, right? Right. As Tom, I think Tom Sutton is one of the artists. Yeah, and. Um, it was just like and Sutton is perfect for the to draw a blue hairy funny guy. And I'm pretty sure those he, issues had, he had to wear like crazy stuff sure those... on his back to straighten it out, right? So he didn't look like a beast anymore. And it, he had like a rubber right. mask he wore over that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You yeah. Have a, so you could have yeah. a, 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 that's right. He used to, so you could have a, a secret identity, right? right. And he, yeah. he had these he had these, ha- these glove hands that look like human hands he would he would pop on. And that's when Patsy Walker finds out his secret and starts to blackmail him that it should become a superhero. 
Right. Oh, there, there you go. go. Right. Which connects to the to the Hellcat. Guys, things are so stupid. But you know, <laughs> yeah, none of the big later sense, on man. Netflix we have Patsy Walker and the Defenders and and yeah. Luke Cage. Right. You know, all these storylines are 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 they go over them again. Yeah. Here's the here's the issue of the Defenders where Nighthawk, Doctor Strange, the Hulk, and Valkyrie are brought to a standstill by tapping tommy yes tapping tommy <laughs> who i think is the worst marvel character of all time i do absolutely terrible, right without a question gets. the theater of fear yeah <laughs> tapping tommy is the worst i yeah. i i don't even remember i i had this issue i read all the defenders i had no memory of tapping tommy or the know. best he's either the worst or the best so why do they bring it back for the netflix with, uh, with a completely different sort of street level set of characters it was they owned, like they owned the name they didn't know what to call yeah. them. and luke cage had been a defender and the and daredevil had been a defender and it you know but yeah it didn't have anything to do with the brand of the defenders as a as the non-team as the not avengers all right i have to share this one just because it's the ultimate klaus like cart um cover oh you see it you guys can see it right yeah, yeah. yeah. look at that yeah. G- yeah. that Mr. Gill and Klaus Jansen just right. killing it. Well, except that Mr. Gill probably just did sticks. Well, <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It probably looked like toys, right? Dancing right. across the dancing across the cover. That's probably true. Yeah, there's Klaus no probably Klaus probably dr- really drew it, but it was, there was yeah, just enough Mr. Cool. Gill there for you to tell it was a it was a Gill cover. Right. Yeah, the pose is totally gill, but it's just knowing what Klaus Klaus does not ink, he finishes. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. When I was pretty, a younger person, looking. I used to just think of the inker as somebody that traced the pencils. Right. That was pretty much that's what, what I thought too. And then I, I actually saw you, at what point did you start to realize that wasn't the case when you saw the same penciler with different inkers and went started to that, notice the difference? That was part of it for sure. And also it came from studying film. And recognizing that your inker is your lighter, it's really right. what it is. And you think about the difference the control of light makes in film, and then it all snaps into place of the importance of the inker. What I when I noticed it was who inks Sal Buscema. Yeah, because so it's, it's like, it could be really good. It could be really good, right. And it's like it's the same penciler, and it's the yeah. same sim. It's a similar poses. Uh, there's Vince Coletta on Sal Buscema, which within, makes within, me within, a, within, within, a, within a within like six months or a year at, at the very most, they had Klaus and Vince Coletta both inking Sal. That's that's like night and day. Yeah, and then you get then you get guys like Bob McLeod or Leia Loa, who are closer to Klaus than they are Vince Coletta. Joseph then, Rubenstein, another one, was really good on him. Who? Who? Joe Rubenstein? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Was, I feel amu- I, I'm amused that Sal was only as good as his anchor when you realize he came to Marvel as an anchor. Yes. <laughs> he was, yeah. He was yeah. supposed to be an anchor first, and, and John wanted his brother wanted to ink all the stuff, right? It's like yeah. that's my guy, but he had this talent for <laughs> poor son of a bitch lost sixty pages a month or something. Yeah, so he was. It was like George. Was too Tuska. valuable to ink. Same with George Tuska. It's like how that were fast you are. Uh, penciling pays better. Yeah, I was going to say, it was probably just an economic decision for yeah, Sal. Penciling, penciling is why either five or ten dollars more a page. So why wouldn't you, know. you do two books a month at penciling rate? The headmen show up for the first time on a cover in issue thirty-three of the Defenders. Show me that. Show me that. Let me you see. They're see in it. the story sooner than that, though. I think they first appear in like. In well, that was that was sort of Marvel's trick, where they would they would debut a character like that, and then the next issue, once you were once you were hooked, the next issue would be their cover appearance. Yeah. I mean, look how great that is. The guy with the melting face and Ruby Tuesday. And well, yeah, it's awesome. I don't even know who the, what do they even say the guy's name? Nagin, I guess, is the name of the guy with the gorilla body and the human head. Yeah, that's the series is completely off the hook by now. It's, they transplant <laughs> the, the whole brain gets transplanted into a deer or something. It's just, it makes, it's terrible. It's wonderful. That's a, that's a guild cover too. And that looks like Klaus. Yeah, well, he, yeah, that would have been, well, it was the issue right after the last one where I showed you it was like the ultimate. Right. Gil yeah. Klaus can so it's not it's not surprising this would be Gil and Klaus again but look at look at Klaus like curbying up those machines oh well, yeah I guarantee you Gil didn't bother with that <laughs> uh, Gil Gil just drew a, a handful of lines in a boxy shape that's yeah time to move on yes my boy but if I'm the editor of this I say if you go back to that image I, I'm the editor I reject it and say that you've got Ruby Tuesday in the wrong place 
Ruby should be standing where Droopy Dog is standing, and Droopy Dog should be behind the the Gorilla Man's arms. I would say that Gil probably didn't even have Ruby Tuesday on that cover. The editor wanted her in there, and somebody else drew her in there because that doesn't look Gil like at all. Also, if you if you put if you put Ruby in place of Droopy, then there's a balance where Valkyrie is. <laughs> <laughs> that's a deep dive, folks. Yep, yep. <laughs> that's, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> thanks for visiting geek view tavern remember to like share subscribe and click the bell to get notified come back soon